a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, might as well say, would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please won't you be my neighbor? Good morning. How are you? Are you my neighbors? All right, Bible says love your neighbors. We scoot this over a little bit. Now for something completely different, right? How are you? I'm looking around, I think I know everybody, and so you know we're not crazy. Uh, we're doing something a little different for the next couple of weeks. We've had a really tough series we've been working on. Our normal uh, st- approach is expositional preaching. It's preaching line by line through the books of the Bible. And uh, it, we just finished up a really tough section, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We, we knew, again, we don't do random. We do things on purpose. And we knew it would be time for a shift, a change, something completely different for Winfield Baptist Church. So if you're new... Everybody's new today. Uh, everybody's new. So I'm looking forward to this series. Uh, it's called Bible Story Time, and Pastor Andrew will get his opportunity to wear the cardigan uh, before this is all over as well. But uh, we're going to walk through some characters in the Bible, characters that you remember from children's church, Sunday school, uh, and we're going to understand why they're in the Bible. What is the big picture? Why are their stories told? And we're going to see what we can glean from them. And I, and I pray that this series will be an encouragement to you. Uh, as we will see through these characters, God used real people, flesh and blood, just like us, to do some amazing things, which means he can use us. And so I encourage you to turn in your Bible to Genesis. We're going to start at the beginning. Uh, we'll begin with Abraham. And we're going to talk through his life. It could take several hours, so I hope you've got something planned for lunch or a little bit later. Uh, We'll be in chapter 18 to start. I'm going to read verses 1 through 16, and then I'll shift over to chapter 21. This is the highlight. This is the big event um, for Abraham and Sarah. All right, beginning in verse 1, The Lord appeared again to Abraham near the oak grove belonging to Mamre. One day Abraham was sitting at the entrance to his tent during the hottest part of the day. He looked up and noticed three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he ran to meet them and welcomed them, bowing low to the ground. My Lord, he said, if it pleases you, stop here for a while. Rest in the shade of this tree while water is brought to wash your feet. And since you've honored your servant with this visit, let me prepare some food to refresh you before you continue on your journey. All right, they said, do as you've said. So Abraham ran back to the tent and said to Sarah, hurry! Get three large measures of your best flour, knead it into dough, and bake some bread. Then Abraham ran out to the herd and chose a tender calf and gave it to his servant who quickly prepared it. When the food was ready, Abraham took some yogurt and milk and the roasted meat, and he served it to the men. As they ate, Abraham waited on them in the shade of the trees. Where is Sarah, your wife, the visitors asked. She's inside the tent, Abraham replied. Then one of them said, I will return to you about this time next year, and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Sarah was listening to this conversation from the tent. Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time, and Sarah was long past the age of having children. So she laughed silently to herself and said, How could a worn-out woman like me enjoy such pleasure, especially when my master, my husband, is also so old? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, Can an old woman like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return about this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she denied it, saying, I didn't laugh. But the Lord said, No, you did laugh. Okay, flip over to chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. It says, The Lord kept his word and did for Sarah exactly what he had promised. She became pregnant and she gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. This happened at just the time God had said it would. 
And Abraham named his son Isaac. Eight days after Isaac was born, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded. Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. And Sarah declared, God has brought me laughter. All who hear about this will laugh with me. Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse a baby? Yet I have given Abraham a son in his old age. Won't you stand with me as we ask a blessing? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the stories. Thank you for the history. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for what we're about to do today and learn from the life of Abraham, your servant, the pioneer of faith. Bless us in a special way. Those of us who already know you, we, we need to hear this to be encouraged today. And those who don't need to hear it to understand how we're made right with God. And so I pray that's the end for all of us here today. So now bless your word. Speak through it. Remove me from it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. What an exciting story. He is 100 years old. She is 90 years old. And here they are being woke up every two hours from an infant crying. Can you imagine that? Is, is that exciting? No, I, I'm 51 and I, I don't think I would want to hear that. But they were so fired up because God was faithful. And you know, we could summarize this one way and say, is anything too hard for God? We could do that. We'd have our lesson done. We could stand up, we could sing a song, we could ask the, the invitation to, to be open, and we could leave here knowing the truth, that there's nothing too hard for God. But there's more to the story. Obviously, the Bible shares a lot about Abraham, so let's talk about Abraham a little bit and see. The story purposely goes all the way back to the beginning. The author of the book tells us that Abraham was in the line of Shem, and Shem was in the line of Seth. And so you can direct this all the way back to Adam and Eve, the lineage of Abraham. Okay? Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the three sons of Noah, the father of all humanity now because the earth was destroyed. Japheth went to the north. That's where most of us are from. We're European background. Ham went to the south. That would be the African nations. And he had some in the Middle East. And Shem was the Middle East. And so Abraham was of Shem, the Middle Eastern descent. But where was he actually from? He was from Ur. Do you know where Ur is? Anybody? Iraq. Abraham, the father, ironically, of the Jews, was of Iraqi birth. That's where he was born. That's where he was from. Then his father moved them to Haran, and Haran is in Turkey. So Abraham was an immigrant in Turkey from Iraq, and God called him. Called him at an old age of 75 years old. Wow. Isn't that interesting? I think it is. It's really kind of cool. Does it matter where we're from, who we're from? No. God cares about us. And God speaks to him. And, and God tells this pagan idol worshiper, which is what he was, a pagan idol worshiper at 75, he tells him in chapter 12 of Genesis, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to a land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Wow! God speaks to this old, unsaved, pagan worshiper and gives him this hum humongous promise. But he requires him to do something. Leave. Pack your bags and go somewhere. I'll tell you when you get there. And he did. This pagan heard from God and tried to follow God, and he gets there, and God says, this is it. Look around. This is what your descendants are going to own. Wow, God is good. And so Abraham settles in, he settles into Canaan with his family for a period of time, and then a famine hits. A famine hits, and instead of asking God what he should do, instead of waiting on a word from the Lord, he shows his lack of faith and his doubt, and he runs to Egypt. He runs to Egypt, and, and his doubt and his fear lead to more in-depth sin. Because he gets there, and he thinks, my smoking hot wife is going to get me killed. She's gorgeous. She's 65, and, and she's a looker. And the king's going to wind up killing me to take her because she's so beautiful. So guess, here's, honey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to tell everybody you're my sister. Really, it's a half-truth, but we're going to tell them that so I can save my hide. Sure enough, that's what happens. His, his failure to trust in God, his failure to, to believe God and, and look to God leads to this sin 
uh, of, of lying and deceit. And sure enough, the Pharaoh buys it, takes his wife Sarah, gives, gives Abraham all these blessings, all these animals, all these herds and sheep. And so his lie works, right? Sin is okay because it produces something that we want to have. And so here you go, here you have this guy who's trying to follow after God, but quickly falls into sin, puts his wife in a dilemma. Should I tell the truth and spare my own sexual morality and get my husband killed? Or should I sleep with another man? Think of the condition that this sin put his family in. He sinned against his wife, he sinned against the Pharaoh, and it brought disease in Pharaoh's family. And Pharaoh finally figures it out, hey, why did you lie to me? Take your wife and get out of here. He didn't belong in Egypt, not yet. His descendants would come there, but not today. He needed to be back in Canaan. And so he gets back in Canaan. And now we learn something, something about Abraham that most forget. Abraham was like Conan the Barbarian. Uh, He wasn't this old, weak man. And he's 75. He has to run and rescue his nephew Lot, who, by the way, when they get to Canaan, the land gets so huge or their their lots get so huge, excuse me, between Lot and Abraham that they have to separate. And we'll come back to that in just a minute, okay? So they've got to separate. He gets to rescue Lot. He pulls a Conan the Barbarian, goes and saves Lot and his family, brings him back. I mean, this is is such a cool story. But the, the pinnacle of the story really happens in chapter 15. Abraham is of good lineage. He is from Shem, from Seth, right, from Adam and Eve. He, he can trace that all the way back. He's trying to follow God. He's doing his best, but he's failing. But then finally, God speaks to him, and it's very powerful. God says, do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your very great reward. And he reiterates his promise that your children and your grandchildren are going to be as many as the stars in the sky. Uncountable. And this time, something is said of Abraham that is so, so important. Chapter 15, verse 6 of Genesis says, Abraham believed the Lord, or Abram. And the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. What's that mean? What's it mean in our terms? It means Abraham is now saved. He is now right with God. Okay, He is now going to go to heaven regardless of whether the son is born. And regardless of what happens the rest of his life, he is now righteous because of his faith. This is a good takeaway. This is why you have your handout that says takeaway. What you should write here in your takeaway is Abraham was saved by grace through faith. Okay? If you're going to write something down, Abraham is saved by grace through faith. It wasn't his family. It, it wasn't his location. It wasn't his attempts to be right with God on his own. It said he was made righteous by faith. So that's the question we have to start with. Like Abraham, are you right with God? Have you been made righteous because of faith? Abraham knew a couple of things that come out in the story. One, he knew that there would be a required sacrifice. It comes after our story that I read that he takes his son up. You know the story to offer him as a sacrifice. And the son says, Dad, where is the sacrifice? And dad says, God will provide a lamb. Abraham knew, looking forward, that God would provide that perfect sacrifice, that lamb. And he also believed in the resurrection because as the author of Hebrews tells us, he knew that if the child died, the Lord would raise him to life. So Abraham believed two things, that God required an ultimate sacrifice and that there was a resurrection, that God had the power of resurrection. And because of his faith, he was made right. So are you right with God? I don't care if you've been to church all your life. I don't care if your parents are saved. I don't care what environment you were raised in. You're lost if you have not been made right by grace through faith. It happens the same way that it happened with Abraham thousands of years ago. There's only one way to be right with God. That's my faith in Jesus Christ. The Lamb of God that John the Baptist proclaimed to come to take away the sins of the world. Have you trusted in Him? Have you said, forgive me of my sins Make me one of your children. That's the first takeaway. Abraham was saved by grace through faith. Okay? And he was perfect after that, right? Right? After the switch was thrown and he's right with God, he doesn't sin anymore. (laughs) Wrong. Okay? Wrong. It's really kind of cool. So Abraham's right with God now, just like most of us are. And guess what? He did it again. Even after he's saved, even after he's made right with God, he still falls into sin. 
this time we can blame Sarah a little bit. Sarah's getting old in her age, and she says, Honey, I, I just can't do it. There's no way I'm going to have a baby. They say you're going to have a son. It's not going to be by me. Why don't you have sex with my slave? Here's Hagar. She's a lot younger than me. She's still childbearing age. You have sex with her, and you'll have your son, and we will fulfill God's plan that way. Abraham says, absolutely not. I'm a Christian. I'm right with God. I would never cheat on you, honey. I wouldn't have sex with another woman. No way. God knows what to do. Did he say that? No, he didn't say anything. He said, yes, dear. Right? At 85 years old, he takes Hagar into his tent, and he has sex with her, a woman who he's not married to. And yes, it produces a child and a son. Oh, so I guess it's all right for sin to be involved in God's plan. I guess it's okay if we can decide how to make things happen. No, right? This was a tremendous sin, even after he was right with God, that led to a lot of consequences that still cause problems today. There are consequences to sin. This man of God still fell into sin after being right. God kicked him out of the family, right? He sinned after being made righteous. He was done. God eliminated him, right? No, God still continued to use him. Okay? He still continued to use him. Now, let me go back. There's, a, there's an interesting takeaway sandwich between the two chapters that I read from. I told you that Lot and Abraham were separated. Okay? It just got too big. And, and Abraham said, Lot, you pick. And where did Lot pick? Anybody remember? He pitched his tent towards Sodom. Okay? He pitched his tent towards the lights, the big city. It even says, it even says, that the people of this area were extremely, extremely wicked and constantly sinned against the Lord. And so Abraham had to watch his nephew, who he took in as a son, willingly pitch his tent in Sodom. That's another good takeaway for us. All right, you can write this down. Be careful where you pitch your tent. We can learn this from the story of Abraham. Be very careful where you pitch your tent, right? Lot saw the lights, he saw the big city, he saw the excitement. He was a young man, Abraham was an old man. He had lived under that that teaching, that guidance, and now, hey man, it's my turn to live, and I'm going to live my way. I'm going to the big city. I know those people are wicked, I know they're sinning against God, but boy, it's fun to live like that. Be careful where you pitch your tent, right? Be very careful where you pitch your tent. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? They were destroyed. What happened to Lot? He lost his wife because of his sin. Stop and think about it. You know, this may speak to different people. Maybe this speaks to a younger generation. I know those teenagers want to break away so quickly. They want to get away from mom and dad. They want to pitch their tent where they can have fun. They want to get as close as they can to Sodom. I can play that game, right? I can be this and be that at the same time. I can dabble a little bit in Sodom and still be God's person. Be careful where you pitch your tent. There's destruction that comes when you pitch it near Sodom. We learn that from the story of Abraham. Okay? All right, so our story picks back up. Abraham, he he prays. He prays for Sodom. He he says, God, please don't destroy it. You know, and, and, and God does. God still destroys it, but it does save Lot. Okay? It does save Lot. Now, guess what happens? Abraham moves to Gerar, and he does it again. He repeats his sin. He doubts that God can protect him. Again, his wife's even older now, but she's still smoking hot. So he's afraid that Abimelech's going to take her and kill him. So he says, honey, let's pull that old thing again. Let's tell him that you're my sister so he doesn't kill me. Sure enough, tells him that she's his sister. Abimelech says, all right, I'll take that beautiful woman. She can be in my house now. And then all of a sudden, all the people are, are Enable to have children. They're barren because of what happened. And Abimelech says, what have you done with me? This time something different happens. This time we see the progression, okay? We see Abraham's dip, but it's, it's an upward trajectory because this time he does something specific. He confesses. He confesses to the ones he sinned against. He confesses to Abimelech. He confesses to his wife. He confesses that he is wrong. And he prays to God for that forgiveness and for the restoration And God does. God restores the people because Abraham confessed. Here's another good point for you, okay? Abraham knew the truth. This is what, again, on his trajectory, this is why we know he was right with God because he knew, okay, I sinned, I messed up. What's the solution? 
Ah, repent. I've got to confess my sins to God and I've got to change. I've got to go to the people I sinned against and tell them that this is my fault. I was wrong. Please forgive me. And he did. He confessed his sin. This, I think, is the biggest takeaway for us. And you can write this down. God's not finished with me. God's not finished with me. Because Abraham continued again on that trajectory to where he's going to have that baby and they're going to be blessed. But he is still on a path that's kind of cyclic. And he still sins occasionally. He still falls back into sin. And God does not eliminate him. God continues to use him in spite of his faults. And so on this path, he has figured out, I know how to get back up. I confess my sins to God. He was sexually immoral, right? He, he, he was deceitful. He doubted God. He committed several major sins against God, and yet God continued to use him because he figured out, right? God's not done with me. Please forgive me. We, we know the Scripture. The Scripture says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to what? Forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Two important things that Abraham knew and that we know. As Christians, we are not perfect. We are going to fail. And when we fail, not if we fail, we confess our sins. We confess it to the person we sinned against. And we confess it ultimately to God because every sin is offense against God. And so we confess our sins and we're not done. We're cleansed of that unrighteousness. In other words, we're given the power to get past that sin. We don't have to live in it anymore. We are cleansed and God can continue to use us. So no matter what you failed at, no matter where you have been and what you have done, if you confess your sins to God, He forgives you, cleanses you of all unrighteousness and continues to use you. To me, that's the biggest encouragement because I'm flesh and blood. I'm on that trajectory. I know I'm saved. I, I know, as, as Chris said very clearly in his message yesterday, I know that I'm right with God. But I also know I still sin. And, and I look at the life of Abraham and I go, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Maybe I live to be 100 years old. And I, I don't want a baby at 100. I don't know what he's got going on in my life. But I'm still on that trajectory, even though I fail. I confess my sins to God. He cleanses me of all unrighteousness and takes me to the next step. And so please remember, if you learn nothing else from this sermon, God's not done with you. Okay, he's not done with you. So how do we wrap this up, right? You get very fortunate. I didn't know how long this would take. Um, how do we wrap this up? First, I think we start with, with that part. That part is Christians, believers, people who are already made right with God through faith. What is it we need to confess? What is it that's holding us back? Is it bitterness? Is it unforgiveness? Is it a sexual sin? Is it doubt? Is it fear? What is it that we need to give up so that we can get back on that trajectory and God can use us? Today is that day to stop and consider and think about it and pray about it and ask God, say, God, what is it that's keeping me from pleasing you? And so today is the day to do that. This will be a great opportunity. Don't be embarrassed. Come and pray, right? Come and pray today and say, God, forgive me. What about those who are living near Sodom? Those who are dancing, those who are trying to play both. Those who are thinking, I can be a Christian and I can be in Sodom at the same time. Okay, that is a huge risk to take because the sins of Sodom will bleed over. They will influence you. And so maybe you need to get away from Sodom and maybe that needs to be your prayer. Or maybe, maybe you realize that like Abraham, you're trying to follow after God and you keep stumbling and you keep falling and you keep making mistakes and you're trying to figure it out. Well, maybe it's because you haven't received Christ. Your desires are correct. Your, your path is, is, is a good attempt at that right trajectory, but... You can't get there without faith in Jesus Christ. Today could be the day of your salvation. Today could be the day that you kneel and pray, God, forgive me of my sins. I believe your son Jesus Christ died for me. I believe you raised him from the dead so that I could know that I have eternal life. Please come into my life and change me and make me your child. And today the angels in heaven will rejoice. So we're going to do that. We're going to pray. The worship team is going to get ready. I'm going to come and pray. 
I invite you that if it's not about you, maybe it's about somebody else. Maybe you know somebody living next to Sodom that you want to pray for. Maybe you know somebody who's on that trajectory, but they're in the pit right now because of some sin in their life. Maybe you know somebody who's not saved. Let's have an old-fashioned altar call this morning. I encourage you. I challenge you. Come and pray as we sing.